Let's start. Great, thank you. So here we go. If um, panelists want to mute themselves just for a minute, uh, not to silence you, um, but just to focus. So hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Marnie Badham, an artist researcher at RMIT University in Narm, Melbourne, where I currently lead CAST, the Contemporary Art and Social Transformation Research Group in the School of Art. I'm an uninvited guest from Turtle Island, Canada, where I grew up on the lands of the Anishinaabe, Lakota, Dakota, and people of the Métis Nation. That's near Treaty 4. So today I have the pleasure of calling in from beautiful Bunurong country, and I acknowledge the many language groups on which on whose unceded lands we each sit on today. I'd like to pay special respects to elders, past and present, and of course, all Indigenous people here with us today and listening today. So a visual description for those are who, lis who's are, who are listening today. I'm wearing a green t-shirt. I have shoulder length brown curly hair. I'm wearing glasses and purple earrings made by the artist Leah Papa. I'm zooming in from home and I have a bookcase behind me with lots of plants, artworks and books on it. Now I'll introduce the symposium in speakers. Counter Monuments, Indigenous Settler Relations in Australian Contemporary Art and Memorial Practices. What a week. We've heard from some serious heavyweights, in particular the Indigenous artists and academics who have creative and uh, sorry, who have created and held this space um, for really important conversations and for our learning. This symposium contributes to important debates regarding the public acknowledgement of difficult colonial histories and the decolonization of dominant settler narratives, institutions, and symbols. It offers unique insights into the processes of creating artworks on violent colonial histories, from rejected artwork proposals to tense negotiations with commissioners to the consideration of Indigenous approaches to memorializing. Importantly, we've heard how thinking through public memorials and artworks can firstly provide spaces of remembrance and healing for Indigenous people, and secondly, how they can serve to both educate and confront an ignorant, ignorant settler public. So in this third and final session of the symposium, we'll hear from the Unbound Collective on their sovereign acts of anti-memorial love, and John Mundine on remembering and forgetting, forgiveness and not forgetting. We're sorry to announce that Nika Lehman and Maddie Clark are unable to present today, um, but sending lots of love to them if they're listening. We look forward to their participation in the following book project. So instead, I've asked Genevieve Greaves and Amy Spears, our conveners, to join us at the end of the session to help reflect on this week. I'd also like to welcome and introduce our interpreters, Tyson Bowl and Kat Edmonton's, Ed, pardon me, Edmonds, who will be assisting us tonight. And a reminder to our presenters and to myself um, to speak slowly and take breaths between sentences so our Auslan interpreters um, can, can do their job and translate for us. So the event will be recorded for release as video on ACA's website as well. All right, the main acts. Our first presentation comes from the Unbound Collective. They will share for 20 minutes before we move on to John's talk. We'll have a Q&A session after these two presentations. So please submit your questions via, via the Q&A tab for the end of the talks. So here we have um, the Unbound Collective. This is Ali Gumilia Baker, Faye Rosas Blanche, Natalie Harkin, and Simone Ulalka Tour. 
they address, hi ladies, they address notions of ethical practice, cultural responsibility, and repatriation of story through enacting memory and storytelling and offer poetic interrogations of state colonial institutions, practices, and archives through performance, mixed media projection, and sovereign re-representation. Over to you. Hi everybody. Hi everyone. Hi everyone. Hi. We've had a few um, technical issues. So we have a beautiful PowerPoint, but we're gonna have to describe it to you. Um, we wanna acknowledge that we are zooming in from the unceded Ghana country where the university, Flinders University is located at the foot of the sleeping giant of Nanu. And we are um, honored to be on Ghana country and to be here. We wanna thank Genevieve and Amy for inviting us to talk. So my name's Ali Gamilia Bacon. My family are Merning. We're from the Nullarbor and I've grown up on Ghana country. And I'm Faye Roses Blanche, Ethan Juma Barbara from the African Tablelands. Um, so I'm a rainforest girl. My name's Natalie Harkin. I'm an Arunga woman uh, from here in South Australia on my father's side of the family uh, with connections to quite a big part of the state as um, many of our families have. Um, and I've been working with the Unbound Collective since 2013. Um, creating beautiful work and part of my contribution to the collective is through poetry and poetic interrogations of archives. And hello, my name is Simone. Um, thank you for the beautiful welcome uh, to this incredible event. Um, I'm from the Young Gunjara community, which is northwest of South Australia. And similarly, I've been with the Unbound Collective since we commenced um, quite a while ago now. And um, my particular contribution is song and performance. So the reason why we formed a collective and why we called it um, Unbound Collective, it, we started off thinking about um, ideas of what it means to be bound um, and what are the ideas that set us free. And as academic artists, we were all bound within an institution, but we're also obviously as Aboriginal communities institutionalised. And part of our work was thinking about what does it mean to be sovereign? What does it mean to decolonise? Mm -hmm. And how would we communicate these ideas outside of an institution? Or what does it mean to, to be institutionalised and deinstitutionalised at the same time? And so um, the complex ideas of, of our humanity, but also the racialization of our bodies, um, the kinds of conversations that we have within the university, we wanted to break them out of the institutional space and consider how our communities and how families access um, institutionalised knowledges. And we, I guess we wanted to speak back to the archive. Mm. Do you want to add anything, sisters? Mm. I think a critical part of our work that we do is about um, teaching um, Indigenous perspectives and knowledges, but also how um, knowledge production occurs within institutions like universities. And so part of our work as academics is countering some of those knowledges, but also making visible what's been rendered invisible. And it really goes to um, the idea of counter monuments about how do we actually provide counter narratives and counter responses and counter discourse and language through critical creative responses to actually encourage um, critical thought. Um, and also in our title, we talk about it as acts of sovereign, sovereign acts, or as Faye might refer to, uh, is the quiet of sovereignty. Mm -hmm. And so I guess what the quiet of sovereignty means is, you know, and as Simone, you know, to, to extend on what Simone was saying, 
the reality for us and what Ali was saying, the reality is Indigenous academics or first people's academics in this country within the university space is that we often go into those dangerous places and and even the knowledge around some of those spaces is quite dangerous. And I think in a way we move through those spaces as sovereign people, as sovereign beings, I would, I would probably say. Um, and we are quite in, in the way that we perform our sovereignty, in the way that we speak our sovereignty, and in the way that we own our sovereignty. And that's a real difference, you know, and we've can't, we've through the Unbound Collective, I would I would say that we've really got to a place where we've shed the colonial skin, even though we are still colon a colonised bodies. I think in a way that's an interesting concept when you think about how our bodies move within those colonial spaces, especially when it's about knowledge production. And so I don't know, Nat, you know, you speak about poetry. Your mm. poetry speaks back to that sort of stuff too. So. Yeah, I guess um, when we joined as a collective too, just to go back to the, I guess, the origins of it. We were all doing our PhDs and we we're all working full time. We're all mothers, Faye's a grandmother. Um, we were really time poor um, in lots of ways and being on that lonely PhD journey. Um, and uh, for me, it was also at that write up stage as well. And it was, you know, fine. We were all really, I guess we were loving the research and loving the ideas that we were engaging with and you know, it is a real privilege to sit with those ideas with a PhD and doing that kind of research. But um, there was something incredibly uh, beautiful about what, when we got together and we shared those ideas, we were, we were sharing a lot of common ground and um, I guess engaging with very similar theorists and inspired by uh, very similar, you know, black feminist scholars, um, indigenous uh, scholars globally, indigenous research methodologies, um, and that critical creative practice that uh, we were also engaging in as, as individuals. Um, and then I guess, Ali, do you want to talk about what it was that brought us all together? Um, and then since that, we've done a series of sovereign acts, um, which we might then go into in a bit more detail. Yeah. yeah. So I guess um, part of the performative aspect of the permanence of the colonial landscape in this colonial outpost of Adelaide, Tandanyanga, is the, um, the kind of North Terrace precinct. So in 2015, we developed some experimental work in 2014, and we need to acknowledge, you know, artists run, run initiatives and um, Julie Goff, who was really, who mentored us us in that initial stages of our um, work mm -hmm. and, I, and in particular I think we wanted to speak back to the South Australian Museum as a site in a very very um, dense site of institutions and it sits next to the South Australian State Library and behind the museum sits the Armoury Building which has an incredibly violent colonial history, not only of the colonizers army that were housed there in the early days of the colonization of, of Ghana country, but then as by the, owned by the museum as a site where um, our old people were brought and, and our old people's bodies were taken from that site and exported all over the planet. So part of our counter monument or anti-memorial is about our bodies surviving in this place mm. and being in between those institutions. So our bodies in between buildings, thinking about projecting love poems and answering the call from the archive of our ancestors that are literally contained within those buildings. So we did an ephemeral thing. We, pro we projected light um, onto the State Library. We had films. We had quotes from each other of love poems. Things like, she could not find yourself. Her, she could not find herself in any of your books. Um, Faye's quote, I am no longer your shame. We were interested in the piling up of knowledge around us and how 
there's been an attempted erasure and exclusion, complete erasure and exclusion of our bodies in the space and how we could honour um, our old people. So that was our intention and we worked collectively um, with Ghana elders and community as well as with our colleagues here to really research that history and moved throughout. And so we had um, costumes that we made that were made out of bark and wire and Ooh. fantastic. <gasps> oh, it's there. Oh, yeah, oh good. You. So you can all see it. So this is the State Library wall. Um, this is Faye's hands slapping the building. Mm -hmm. We made these dresses um, in Simone's mm -hmm. mother's backyard. Um, on a trampoline around a campfire with our kids <laughs> with paper mache with flour, sugar and tea mixed into the, the, the bark and the, the chook wire that we wrapped ourselves in and then we put lights in there and we had these tiny mobile projectors and it was so well received at Tana D. We had 300 people around us and Simone was singing her mother's and I'll let her talk about that but yeah just um, it's lovely. We've got the photos there. So, does any of you? Um, I can yarn, but <laughs> let someone else. I think one, one of the things we did a short doco also on just our our expressions of what it means to work as a collective as all Aboriginal women and artists and with community. Um, and one of the things that Nat talked to in her reflection was about repatriation of love. And a lot of the work we write about is about grounded in ideas of love and possibilities and those moments where you are free, even if it is for a moment. Um, and that really resonates in a lot of our work that we do in countering either the representation or actually providing a different narrative so when our children's children see the archival record um, through our creative responses there is another archive and there's another record and it very much goes to um, a lot of the work that Nat does in terms of archival poetics and um, all our work in terms of uh, the relationship we have which is both compelling and violent at the same time in relation to um, the records. Mm. Hmm. Um, I yeah. think to the this idea of counter monuments, uh, anti memorialism um, in terms of the colonial memorial sites that are um, that you know our our cultural precinct that Ali referred to along North Terrace with all those um, uh, buildings that pay homage to the Adelaide establishment and all of those key institutions of power that have represented and confined and categorised us and also held our archives and our, and our bodies, as Ali said. But this, also, this idea for us about what the archive is, so we're, we're responding and we're countering and we are attempting, well, we are interrogating the colonial archives, but we're also really honouring um, our embodied archive and what we bring to the space as Aboriginal women. Um, all of those stories that we carry with us in our blood, in our minds and our hearts, the stories that we're taught, the stories that we maybe don't know, but we know that they are there. Um, and Toni Morrison theorises it around rememory, this idea of rememory, which kind of um, ties into ideas of haunting and haunt hauntology and haunting being a way of knowing and being in the world. Um, and that embodied archive, I think, is, is the thing that has really struck me and what I've really come to um, honour and love um, is the archives that come down from our family. And it's not just oral history, oral memory, it's, it's more than that. So now when we walk through those spaces, um, in the colonial precinct, it actually feels quite different for us now. It feels like we've left, left some kind of imprint and that's our, even though that it's invisible, it's not there, the fact that we've projected our love poems and our film work and, um, and our ideas and all of, the, all of that that inspired us to, to create work together, um, it feels like those walls have absorbed that love and that 
um, those, yeah, that, that embodied archive that we carry with us. Mm. Yeah, blood and bring. Mm. I mean, the other, the other aspect that we've really been interrogating is the numeration of our bodies and the way in which archives are, are numbered and stored Mm -hmm. and um, how we can interrogate and I guess uh, you know we're interested in the work so you want to talk about the mathematics of genocide, of, of genocide the kind of mm -hmm. mathematics of genocide we're interested in black studies and mm -hmm. how how those ideas of the numeration and the dehumanization of our bodies mm -hmm. impact on the way we are seen and not seen in the landscape but also I'm really interested in um mobile memorials and memorials that move and need to be activated and you know Kara Walker's done some really interesting work around like um, monuments to the mobile monuments to the institutions of slavery and her work in particular is calling into question those ideas of monuments to people that disappear because they become so normalized that people forget to see um, the land, the, where we are and so um, we changed our relationship to those institutions of power that had sought to contain us mm. and we broke we um, engaged our sense of what it might mean to be free mm. in relation to the cosmos there's there was nothing between us and the stars we were in between those buildings and that while they have sought to contain us and kill us, we, we, our ancestors and our children and our communities continue to defy that kind of monumentalism of us and that kind of quantification of our bodies mm -hmm. through statistics, mm -hmm. through um, uh, labelling us, through blood quantum, through um, measuring of our bodies and cutting up of our bodies, through all of those ways of, of dehumanisation, we continue to be human in that space. If you want to scroll down, so oh, we can't control the PowerPoint, but if you go down to the bottom, see there's a fire there, um, just below that one, yep, that one, and then the one um, below that, I'm just trying to see, yeah. There's one of the armory building that might be really lovely. So this was Uncle Lewis smoked the place, and literally Adelaide was the, you know, one of the nation's capitals of physical anthropology. The South Australian Museum, Adelaide University, the Royal Adelaide Hospital, engaged and still are in the process of, of, um, I guess, reckoning with their own engagement with those histories. Um, and our critical response, we wanted to do it without permission, but we ended up asking permission. <laughs> we ended up getting permission because we had a fire and there's always a big, they can build Greco-Roman style <laughs> tombs with columns on, on Aboriginal land, but they have a conniption if you want to put a fire on a piece of grass, um, because you know that involves about a million emails to get permission. But anyway, so these ideas, um, are activated and um, our bodies move through the landscape. Do you want to talk about that, Faye? Mm -hmm. I think the um, the exhibition, which you won't see in this particular catalogue that's been shown, oh, no, that we did in um, in Sydney at the New South Wales Art Gallery, was a, um, a quite incredible experience in the sense that we actually entered into the New South Wales Art Gallery um, with uh, our sovereign projections, again, projecting messages um, and responses to, you know, the, the archive and in this, this sense, some incredible visual, you know, paintings. The colonial paintings. The colonial paintings. Ali was just beside herself. She just loved it. And in that particular um, area, which actually was on top of where the, the primitive archives used to be in the, in the um, art gallery, um, we actually sang projected images and were uh, um, welcomed very beautifully by the Gadigal community um, mm -hmm. who supported us through that process. Um, and as part of that um, performance, we actually made our own um, Aboriginal activist banners. Um, and so it was a, a, about a side of activism.
in a place where you don't usually see activism, but through a very gentle um, approach and through um, singing. And so there's a big Captain Cook um, statue by a Māori uh, artist, and we had his name here a minute ago. Yes, Michael um, Parakawai. Parakawai. Sorry. Um, and so I sang to that particular um, statue, which is, you know, it's massive. And so just singing to this statue mm -hmm. um, about our um, expressions of colonialism and the violence of colonialism as well. Mm. Do you want to just keep scrolling through some of those images? Um, and then we can, uh, so the next one down from that one. Um, so keep going. Down so they're the, some of the so, sovereign, um, so at the same time as we were performing at the state, at, behind the state library, behind the South Australian Museum, we also had 10 bus stops and Faye and Simone were the um, incredible poster, poster girls, poster girls <laughs> and were very nervous about putting our sovereign love poems out into the public. So we picked areas where we thought our communities might be and we spoke back to ideas of place um, and mm. what it means to wait, what mm. it means. Uh, Aboriginal people are very mm. patient, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> and we're also very generous. Um, uh, yeah. And I think that's what was really quite exciting about putting up, you know, Simone and I being the poster girls, really. I think it was she always, I, I think, um, you know, the main thing about this also was it was at a time when both Simone and I was teaching. Mm -hmm. And so we would we were teaching like 500 pre-service teachers. And what happened often would be over that time frame would be the students would come up with us and tell us that they saw us. Mm -hmm. um, and that was on those posters. So that was quite an exciting thing. So when we talk about wanting love and when we talk about our bodies as, col as colonised and shedding the colonial skin, I think what's also really interesting is the idea of hope. Mm. And I have had students come up to me and say to me, I really love the fact that when you're teaching us, you're actually talking about, you're leaving us with a hope and not a feeling of guilt. So it's a different kind of, um, it's a flipping of the, the script, I think, which is really, really good um, in this kind of instance. But it's also that critical, Ooh. that idea of critical love. So it's not the warm Sorry. fuzzy, Sunset love. Right? Yeah. <laughs> it's the um, it's the kind of let's go into the guts of what is yeah. the trauma yeah. here yeah. and think about love in that place because ultimately that's mm. what makes us human. Yeah. So and I think yeah. also with the bus shelters, there were ten bus shelters which were in in around um, the Adelaide CBD and oh, and and also Glenelg and Port Adelaide. And um, with the bus shelters, so you can see the, the love poems there. And we did a bit of theorising around the bus shelters about what happens in those places, mm. in, that, in that place of the hold when you're waiting. Mm. And those really quiet times where, you know, so much can happen in that time when you're just waiting uh, for public transport. Um, and so that idea of having a QR code to link up all of the poetry and to very lovingly remind people that they're on Ghana country was something that was really important for us because it is about that invisibility of um, of uh, Ghana presence, Ghana Ghana awareness and knowledge that it's even Ghana country. So many people don't even know mm. that they're on. They they might think, oh, we're on Aboriginal land, or they might not they might ignore it completely. But to have that loving reminder through poetry that you are on Ghana land, and then if they're you know to spark their interest. Um, I don't know how many people actually got onto the QR codes, but it's it would have been a really interesting exercise actually to do some research about who clicked on and how they engaged with those public sites <laughs> of activism, memorialism, and that deep honouring of country in in those unique ways. Yeah. So we we might need to be told to get off because we can <laughs> <t> <laughs> we're all professional lecturers. Talkers. We can talk. <laughs> We talk and talk. So but we um, did send a PowerPoint. I know we've only got 20 minutes. So let's. Um, oh, let's we've yeah, got no, the other got, PowerPoint. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Go down to so the go candle. down to the black and white ones at the bottom and click. Uh, yes, yeah, so one this up. Is, one and up. one down. Okay. One down. One down. One down. Next yeah. one. 
Yeah, 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 thank you. So this was in the Art Gallery of New South Wales and we projected onto the canon of Australian art, onto all the lost uh, pioneers, onto the uh, sheep farmers, onto <laughs> the shearers, onto all of those Heidelberg mob. Um, we projected our resistance poetry onto those paintings and for that moment we spoke back. So I, uh, I felt quite, I mean, I'd studied these kind of works and it was quite a strange experience to be there with the original and performing in this way of kind of projecting light onto the actual, the work itself. So thank you everyone. I don't know how much time have we got and we can keep talking. We can keep we talking. Can talk. <laughs> how much time we've got. It's, uh, it's Marnie here. Um, please keep going. Oh, okay. Okay. More minutes to sort of wrap up. I'm really interested in hearing um, what's next for Un Unbound Collective. Oh, we can talk about that. So um, we've currently got a commission from Maud to do some video work, so Museum of Design in Adelaide to do a um video a series of video works for um the Karawira Parry, which is the also the Torrens River called the Torrens River and Karawira Parry. And um Natalie, do you want to talk about Tarnandi? Yeah. So if you go down actually on that very bottom link of the PowerPoint, you'll see some shadow works. We're doing these kind of it feels quite epic. <laughs> <laughs> the epic backdrop to all of our lives. Um, so as Aboriginal people, I think most of us have a domestic service indentured labour hist indentured labour history, which is not um, part of the wider narrative of South Australia's history, our um, Aboriginal history or our uh, labour history, our women's studies history, um, etc. So um, I mean, South Australia was probably the only state that didn't really participate in the 2006 Stolen Wages Senate inquiry. And it was kind of reprimand, rep, reprimanded for that. Um, but the, 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 I guess the narrative from the state government at, the, at that point in time was that there wasn't an issue here in South Australia. But we all know from our own stories that uh, wages were withheld or they were put into trust funds, or they weren't um, honoured, or people just, you know, our women were um, indentured and forced to, um, for, you know, to do labour for free. So we have these domestic service stories and part of Tarnandi uh, exhibition in October this year, um, we're doing an exhibition, I'm doing an exhibition and working with the Unbound Collective and we've done these beautiful little films. Um, and it's uh, Apron Sorrow Sovereign Tea is the title of the exhibition and uh, currently working with community now to document some memory stories to get some of those really critical important histories on the record. Um, so yeah, I don't know if anybody yeah. else wants to speak about that. And also I'll just tell you that the image behind is called Sovereign Goddess Not Domestic and it's also an honouring of, um, you know, family history where you can see that there is, there's been, um, in my family, my Nana's older sister worked for 40 years without a wage for the policeman in Norwood in Adelaide. And when I found that on the archive, I felt like I was on fire with, with rage for the intergenerational impacts of those domestic labour histories that Natalie's been talking about, the intergenerational impacts on our communities, on our um, economic health and trauma related um, stories and the fact that we know that so many of the broader community know nothing about. And so we still have the Prime Minister coming out and saying there's no slavery in this country. And we know that um, our people have been forced to work and were, were cleaning people's houses while they were removing our children. And um, there's so much reckoning that needs to be done in relation to those histories. And Natalie's work is really important and these oral histories are really important. So I'm just sending you now, Bianca, um, 
or Amy a little video yes. link we if can, you it goes for two minutes we'd love to show it so if you if we've got time we can show it but if we haven't that's fine as well so um, tell us when we're time comes up thanks <laughs> we're, we're over time now but I think okay. I think we need to fit two minutes of video in and then straight from the video we'll move over to John if that's okay so okay. Yeah. So, thank you so video, much Unbound video, if you can just make sure that the sound is up if, just for everybody who's watching um put the sound up okay. and um because the soundscape is really subtle um we work with an amazing editor jessica wallace and she's put together an incredible soundscape with our input and um but it's quite subtle so up the volume if you can <laughs> um Great. have you got that bianca to help us thank you Maybe not. There we go. Great. Thank you. Thank Turn you. the volume up, everyone. And we'll see you in two minutes. Thank you, Unbound. Just waiting for my thank video. you. There we go. We're back. So thank you, Unbound, um, to our audience listening at home or in your office. Um, there's a Q&A box that we'd like you to put your questions into for after the next talk. And I, because I know there's a lot of fans in the crowd and um, Unbound Collective, uh, an all woman collective working in community as all artists, scholars in an institution and with public audiences, both first peoples and possibly an ignorant settler public. Yet you keep set, you know, you keep love, critical love at the center of your artwork and teaching. So Thank you so much for sharing your um, important work with us. Looking forward to some more discussion a little bit later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to invite uh, John to come on screen now. Um, John Mundine uh, is an incredible um, uh, panelist joining us today. Um, we might have a bit of conversation throughout his talk. John is a member of the Bangalung people of the Northern New South Wales and is an independent curator, activist, and writer. 
There he is. Hey, John. His career has helped revolutionize the criticism and display of contemporary Aboriginal art, including through prominent curatorial positions held in many national and international institutions. Between 1979 and 1995, he worked as an art advisor at the Milangimbi, uh, at Milangimbi in the Crocodile Islands and at Bula Bula Arts in Arnhem Land, where he originated and oversaw the Aboriginal Memorial Project. In 1993, he received a Medal of Order of Australia for service to the promotion and development of Aboriginal arts, crafts, and culture. In 2005 to 2006, he was research professor at the National Museum of Ethnology in Osaka, Japan, and so much else. What an honor to have you here with us today, John. Thank you. Can you hear me? Uh, Loud and clear. Thank you. Um, after that, that was fantastic. I love that statement uh, of this collective. I, you must remember uh, history, which they do, I gather. History is about individuals as well as great people. Great people. Great people exist everywhere. Great people do things through simple events. Uh, history is also not about monuments. So we're talking about monuments. Uh, as I've said in my statement, uh, uh, we must remember a monument is a structure erected, some massive thing to memorialize people, place, event of great significance, apparently, society. A memorial, however, is an act, is an art object uh, in the widest definition of that, a song, a poem, a sacred space, a space made sacred, a simple ritual. These things are what these women do. That's what we all do. Our lives are read uh, historically and made meaningful through very simple things. And that's what makes up a society and it makes up a history a simple ritual, an image. Of course, we think about art, it's an image uh, that is strongly embedded a, an emotional memory to the societal uh, uh, psyche of, of this particular society or nation. Now, as Aboriginal people, uh, as supposedly colonized people, uh, we have never given up uh, our society. We've never sold our souls to anyone. Uh, we have to make our own um, our own statement. We have to re-emphasize or re-state, reassert our uh, sovereignty just to reassert it and say, look, we did not, we are not defeated. We are not, uh, um, we call no man master. And we uh, call no man king. We have no kings or queens. Uh, we are within ourselves an independent person, an independent person, person who is uh, emotionally, intellectually, and in fact, financially, economically independent. People quite often say, why uh, don't you want to buy a house? Why don't you want to invest your money in blah, this or that, uh, that you feel that you can survive without any of these things. You are independent and free in your life. Now, I've worked as a curator, as it said there. I've worked uh, 
I could have just did uh, very conservative things. Independent curator, although I've worked in nearly every state art gallery, I've worked in uh, major art galleries around the world, uh, the Asia Society Gallery in New York, the um, uh, Kunsamlung North Rhine-Westphalen in Dusseldorf, uh, the, uh, um, I can't remember, the, there's too many, there's too many things. It's in about 30 countries I've put exhibitions on and spoken to bring uh, Aboriginal art to those places and uh, through a process of trying to open up ideas of what is a memory, what is art, uh, because art, all art is supposed to engender or make a, an emotional, a visual, uh, visual emotional response. And a visual or emotional response is means that you look at something, you see it, and you are automatically, unconditionally moved emotionally from that uh, space. So uh, uh, an art object, a, a memorial is an art object in the widest definition. It is a a memorial is an art object in the widest definition. It could be a song, a poem, a sacred space or a space made sacred, a simple spiritual ritual, an image that you see a strong, that is strongly embedded, uh, embeds an emotional memory into the societal psyche, into our hearts. It's something carried in the eye, in your mind. It is something that comes from the mind, from the intellect. It could be something that brings automatically, without any thinking, brings out a sorrow or a joy. Uh, from remembering of uh, members of that society. Now, monuments as we know them are generally erected by the victors, by the dominant group in that society. So everywhere in Australia, you see this ridiculous nature of huge stone anywhere, any the most tiny country town will have a sandstone obelisk with a list of names of people who died, uh, Australian citizens who died in this war or that war, usually a colonial war in support of the empire, in support of the British empire here and there. What I would like to see and what I strive to do was to change this idea that we are part of a British empire, that we are, uh, we should recognize that we are not part of an empire anymore. We most probably never were, that uh, we're not uh, British anymore. We can't blame the British, that the nation has to be honest we're dealing with itself and its history and that uh, we can't blame the British anymore, that we have to be adult responsible people in thinking about our national history, our national um, memory, our national psyche within our soul. Uh, Edward Glissant, the Caribbean poet wrote that if we are to achieve these things, we should have to, he insists, we have to remember together. 
and it goes back to other ideas of master-slave relationship about how uh, the victim of a violent act, the perpetrator of a violent act is as much um, involved in the memory of it, involved in the resolution of it, and how uh, we must remember together if we are going to talk about a resolution of uh, the crime that's happened, we have to recognize that they did happen. And it struck in my mind as I became more and more educated in a Western sense, the total stupidity of the uh, denial of this crime that was on the level of uh, any Holocaust in history, the Armenian Holocaust, the Jewish Holocaust, uh, that this crime was such incredible stain on the national uh, psyche, the national idea of itself, that all the exhibitions, or as many as I could muster and construct, had to talk to this idea of that crime. What I would like to see eventually is various land councils, as we have constructed in New South Wales, to uh, make counter monuments. We can talk about knocking down these other monuments. Uh, if they were recontextualized, I was thinking about the statue of Captain Cook that's in Hyde Park that says he was the first uh, white European to discover Australia. Now, of course, he wasn't the first uh, white uh, English person to come to the country. It's well recorded that there were other English people had come to this continent. There were other Europeans who had come to this continent and in fact mapped the continent very widely. Uh, he had those maps when he came here. Uh, the fact that they are not recorded on his, uh, the base of his monument, that he is someone who came here, but he is not the first of anyone. He wasn't the first, as they say, that ever burst upon this silent sea. The sea was not silent. Uh, the sea uh, was alive with people. There were people, other countries had come here, people from uh, Indo what is now called Indonesia. There were people that came here from China. And there were, of course, people that came here from the Pacific. These are the things that should be noted on Captain Cook's uh, um, uh, statue. But I uh, cannot go around knocking down statues. Uh, I cannot waste my time doing this. I want to get on with, uh, as an artist, as a curator, as an Aboriginal historian, of, as I am through my living, that they should, uh, I want to get on with erecting and correcting monuments that tell you the true history of this country to bring Aboriginal people, Aboriginal individuals, Aboriginal personalities into that history. So all in my work, I've tried to put exits together that uh, personalized all the Aboriginal artists who were uh, not mentioned in the records, all the Aboriginal artists that were diminished as individuals, as human beings, as intellectual human beings with particular personalities and lives and, society and socialized uh, personalities, that they had personalities, how would they 
be seen to have acted against uh, the colonization that happened. That is a task, a monumental task to some degree. It is not uh, unachievable. It is not uh, something that should not be done. It is something that is impossible. These are the things we should be working on in our cultural practice. These are the things we should be uh, forcing people to uh, the, the Australian nation to look at. In my study of how art was perceived, how cultural expression was perceived within Australia, uh, in what they call the Australian nation now, um, how that was perceived, it seemed to me that just about every decade, uh, at least, if not every generation, people came to be to see that there were there was another history, that there was uh, a crime committed. We talk about massacres, etc. I refuse to use the word ma massacre anymore. Uh, I want to use the word murders. There were murders. Massacres sort of diminishes the intent of the, uh, the event, of the act. It also reduces uh, the individual nature of people responsible. Murders are committed by individuals on other individuals. So I need to forget about massacres. Uh, they happen in the United States every five minutes, according to the legal definition of uh, something about four people. If more than four people are murdered uh, in one event, that's called a massacre. Now, we know uh, massacres uh, occurred in uh, tens of thousands of people within our nation. They are families uh, uh, to all of us. My friend uh, Jackie Katona, in her uh, statement of uh, welcome to country, as we might say, that she would make, she would say, I would like to acknowledge all the people of this land, of this place, their deaths and their problems are my problems, uh, they are my uh, disasters, they are my problems to solve. They are the problems of all Aboriginal people. They are problems of all the national society, the national so psyche. As I was beginning to say, uh, every decade, it seems the Australian uh, nation is uh, almost comes to a recognition of the terrible history of this country. They almost come to feel a guilt, but they also feel that something needs to be done, a reconciliation as we, uh, as a government department that's been set up about reconciling these things. Uh, they, come to almost reach this point of passing legislation. They almost come to a point of putting this into the schools so that every school child will know this of whatever creed, color of religion, will know this and uh, be embedded with this and grow up knowing this crime, this crime has happened, that they will then uh, grow up and move in the next generation to uh, make amends, to do something, uh, not only in monetary terms or legislation, so that people like myself or the people who spoke before me, that other people can actually 
really feel something has been accepted by them. The nation has said, look, we are sorry, more than we are sorry, we are going to do something very uh, um, monumental, monuments that aren't, we're going to do something monumental that isn't in a big sandstone building. It's going to be in a political act, political legislation, and that's the monument that we need in this country. These monuments, uh, sandstone buildings, giant rocks with, uh, um, with metal plaques on them, are things uh, that uh, are there. They, if anyone can remember Ozymandos, uh, Shelley's poem, uh, you know, look upon my work, she mighty and despair. These monuments will pass. They'll pass, they'll disintegrate. They will uh, leave. That's why I said a memorial as against a monument is something that will sit in our minds and be carried in our hearts. Uh, these things, uh, true cultural things, are things that uh, become a cultural practice, a way of thinking about the world, a way of uh, being warm. We warm, we are warm, we are happy, we have joy because we know we have done something special. We have recognized other people to be human. Aboriginal people of all different groups have lived on this continent that uh, every year uh, has tens of thousands of years added to it, 20,000, 30,000, 50,000, etc. The thing, uh, that has allowed us to remain on this continent and thrive in what's called the greatest desert in the world and all this sort of crap. Uh, it's actually a very rich environment, a very rich uh, thriving uh, environment. And we have lived here, our antecedents, our ancestors have lived here for thousands of years, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years. How have we done that? Why haven't we uh, succumbed to murdering each other, to killing each other? The thing that we've learned is how to live with each other. Now I work in art, uh, visual art, and, uh, and, and uh, tied to that, of course, you can't have visual art, without performance arts, sonic, singing, dancing, use of space to move people to feel, to become emotional, to become emotional about that space, to become emotional about all spaces on the continent, to become emotional about all other people on the continent. The true art of uh, Aboriginal art, the true art of Aboriginal society, which is why we were still alive in very large numbers when the British came here to set up a jail, really, was we had learned the art of living with other people. We had a number of societies set up a number of societal structures set up within our uh, way of living that allowed us to live with each other without mass murders of each other. There war, were wars against different groups. Different tribal groups had massive vendettas against other people other groups. There were personalities that held vendettas against other personalities within society. But ultimately there were structures set up to uh, solve those uh, conflicts in a way 
that didn't annihilate everyone, that didn't pick on the uh, lower classes of that society, that didn't, didn't pick on the most deprived in that society, and didn't demean people's personal expression of uh, uh, in song, dance, etc. Structures were set up that even the smallest groups within that society, the would apparently be the most simple-minded in that society, still had to be included in any ritual. If you did not have them take part, that ritual, that uh, devotional performance to make the world turn, to make the seasons uh, approach and come into being, could not happen without everyone within that society. This is something I noticed, I observed, noticed, I observed in my limited uh, time of living in very traditional living and speaking uh, societies uh, where there were no monuments, there were no giant uh, erections of uh, sandstone and granite anywhere. In fact, the words, if there were words written, they were written very symbolically. They weren't in uh, Greco-Roman numbers or Sindu-Arabic numbers. They were uh, very symbolic and believed it came into being from people, um, people coming together to talk about what was the meaning of life, what was the meaning of being with other people. And that was what allowed all of us to exist and survive and thrive. We were thriving. Uh, there are numerous uh, uh, calculations, enumerations. How many Aboriginal people lived here? And basically, they were about diminishing that number. If they diminished that number as much as they could, the crime of the murders, uh, don't talk about massacres, the murders they were committing uh, is... Uh, uh, a lesson, uh, they, uh, oh no, there weren't that many Aboriginals. Uh, they were killing each other anyway, uh, etc. That thing of diminishing the crime, diminishing why uh, we should have these practices to allow everyone to speak, to allow everyone to have their say uh, along gender or age, or different language groups. Those things are what are allowed us, that, that is the true monument of Aboriginal people. Mm -hmm. Now, in my curatorial practice, of course, I live in the very here and now, uh, I tried to add the value or up the value of Aboriginal cultural expression so that in a capitalist society where everything has a money value so that those people could see that their artwork, their personal expression was valued in money terms. Mm -hmm. Now the thing with art and cultural expression is it's a big crime. So I wrote, I'm an art critic as they say, uh, and that could be, as they say, I told somebody one day, you are hated by everyone in Sydney. You must be the most successful art critic <laughs> in Australia, yeah. uh, et cetera. Now, the heart of that goes to the heart of how can you criticise someone else's ideas, ideas of, of wanting something? They're, individual aesthetics about why do I like this as I like that, as against what I like that. And that's why as an art critic, 
you'll find uh, very few people. I have written most probably two pieces or three pieces in, uh, you know, a hundred essays and uh, reviews uh, where I've really criticized a particular artist or a particular uh, art practice. Mm -hmm. And it's because you have to be aware of how this goes to the heart of what people think, how they feel, how what they enjoy, um, and because they don't like uh, the best champagne, they might like a Great Western, or they may eat at McDonald's. Uh, that is not uh, uh, me uh, to tell them you cannot enjoy this. Uh, this is a stupidity that uh, of uh, you know very uh, particular bourgeois uh, aesthetics. John, uh, go on. Sorry, am I finished now? Oh, we're really enjoying your talk, though, is a thing, um, and we're going to really enjoy reading it as well. But we'll give you a chance to have a sip of water. Um, but I'm seeing some questions coming in from the audience for you and Unbound Collective as well. Would you mind if we moved over to that? Uh, that's fine. Uh, yes, I am a Catholic. I am left-handed. Yes. <laughs> if you would. Yeah, but please take the opportunity to wrap up if you'd like to before we move. Well, just one thing I'd like to say, I'm in a great exhibition space. Uh, someone asked me uh, about how would the Aboriginal art, the National Aboriginal art museum look like or art contemporary art gallery what would it look like and i said i just want a giant bear box i'm now in uh, the commercial gallery in sydney in uh, marrickville which is a giant cube square empty box it allows the artwork which you may not be able to see behind me uh which is one of the artist, Aboriginal artist in Australia, uh, Archie Moore, that I've worked yeah. with for 10 years. We can and, see it, it's gorgeous, yeah. And this work behind me is called The Family Tree, or My Family Tree. I've seen three uh, versions of this, one in Queensland, one at the, uh, Univ the University of New South Wales, and this current version, and it's where Archie has went back and uh, uh, built a constructed his own version of his own family tree as against a traditional <clears throat> bureaucratic uh, anthropological family tree. And he's now filled in the boxes to find himself. Another kind of archive um, in the way that Unbound was talking about different yes. embodied types of archives. I might take a moment to thank you very much, John, for your incredible presentation, um, following the incredible presentation, everybody's clapping for you, of, of Unbound Collective. And I've got a couple of questions and we've also got our conveners here who are gonna help us wrap up. I thought we'd have lots of time. I'm really sorry, we're not going to, but no, I'm, gonna jump, I'm gonna jump to, um, one question from the audience and um, while I'm asking that also panelists think of questions or conversations amongst yourselves as well okay so I'm going to start with a question to Unbound Collective which actually came from Jen and Amy do you agree that colonial monuments memorial sites are irredeemable irredeemable or can they be transformed through interventions to be of value to our society? Just as you're thinking about that, I've been listening all week and hearing these um, um, sort of different comments as, uh, and, and ways of thinking about this work as John also talked about artworks, monuments, memorials, legislation, live culture. So, you know, is, and, and, and thinking about the different publics, you know, the trying to educate and confront um, more ignorant settler publics or as a site of remembrance and healing for Indigenous people. So in that question from Jen and Amy, it's 
how can this work, monuments and memorials, um, uh, be transformed? Or are they, in fact, irredeemable? Thanks, Unbound. Thank you. Um, good question. It's a really good question. Um, we we're just talking about whispering. <laughs> um, so um, I think they're both, in a way, they're irredeemable and transformative. They potentially can be activated to be transformative. Um, I, I exhibited at ACA um, eight metres of racist text in a single stack. And one of the issues that I had with these racist texts was that they were being thrown out of the libraries, put into special collections, locked away because they're offensive. You wouldn't happen upon the racist texts as you were cruising through the library. You had to go and search them out. And they're being thrown away from people's bookshelves because people don't want to look in the eye their very recent history. But so in a way, monuments are like those racist texts as well. You know, we can't, we, we, we can't um, erase that. The traces of that are very much in the present, but we can change our relationship mm -hmm. to those monuments. And we certainly need to um, interrogate them, to challenge them, to shed light on the people who they're memorialising and what their values have been and whether those values are values that we consider to be important. Because a lot of these uh, Gunya, um, memorials and the names of our suburbs and our streets and our buildings are people who were incredibly racist and, mm. and ordered the murdering of our people, as John would say, the murdering of, and, and it is because of those murders that we are living in this country. So, and, let, and people want some truth around that and we deserve that. Mm. You wanna add anything else? No, no that's okay. right. Thanks. Oh, thank you. And I might um, pass that same question over to John. So the question is about, you know, these colonial monuments and memorials or sites, are they irredeemable or can they be transformed through some sort of uh, intervention to be of value? Well, everything uh, can be uh, reinterpreted and everything, uh, uh, everything exists in its time. So uh, the thing of, uh, I remember being in St. Petersburg and uh, we're being taken to a number of really massive cathedrals uh, full of gold. And, oh, it was unbelievable, the money that was the luxu luxury of these places. And we asked them, well, well why did, after the revolution, why didn't you pull this down? Why didn't you, this is ridiculous. How did this still here? And they said, we kept them here to take school children to say this is the capitalist, the upper classes, uh, the religious upper classes, how they robbed us. They robbed the common people of uh, all of this. They live like this and we starved outside. Mm. They used them in that context. So that's how they can be used. And as I said with the Captain Cook story, just tell the real story of what happened about him. Uh, don't, he's not the hero, uh, well, etc. whatever he was, uh, and just set out to put your own memorials up. That is, memorialize your family, your friends, all those murders, they're people, <laughs> my time, my, I think about it now, they're people that I knew, or, they're almost people I knew. There were three people who died in jail. They were black deaths in custody. Three people this week, mm. this week. They're still killing us. They're still murdering us. They are people that I would know. I would personally know. Those memorials are what we need to do. Mm. Uh, yeah, these things are there, but they're like um, Egyptian mummies or something. They're irrelevant to our lives. Mm. Nothing against the Egyptians or whatever, but uh, but uh, they're like that. They're like as uh, useless <laughs> as Ozzy Mandos, king of the king of the world, or whatever. Mm. They're they're. 
things we should be just get on the front foot make our own monuments make our if we want to call them that make our own songs make our own uh, our own poems and ideas thank you john um so before we close today i want to throw to amy and um jen to have the last word i've got a few comments just to wrap up at the end but um, Amy, that same question um, around irredeemability or transformational, um, and then you know John's added to that question about thinking about new memorials as well. As well, so are there any thoughts that you have about what you've heard this week? I mean, I know you're an artist working in this space as well, but what have you heard this week that um, can help sort of guide your thinking as you work in the field? Um, well, I'd love to go through all my reflections because there's a ton, but uh, I'm aware that I have probably about one minute. Um, so I think one of the key points that's come up for me is like, um, like what makes a memorial? Like we, we often, we've heard uh, multiple times over the last three days, like that, um, like, to, you know, conversations about temporary or permanent works of art that are either like in public space or in museums. And, you know, for instance, Fiona Foley described one of her works as a monument. And I, it just brings to mind, like, who decides what a monument is? Um, do we wait for the state to sanction it as a monument? Um, or, or are there other things that we can do to embed, a, a, you know, a kind of memorial object or a memorial practice or a ritual or a song, as John talks about, into the national consciousness and 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 provoke thought and feeling about a past that's been ignored for so long. So, yeah, I guess go, like going onwards with our book project, I think that's a big question for me. Is like, how you know, is is it is it something we wait to be sanctioned, or do we just collectively agitate for uh, making our own monuments or having our monuments that already exist being acknowledged properly? Um, so, yeah, I think I think. That's where I'll leave it. Oh, thanks, Amy. No worries. And um, you know, I think the the plural monuments, you know, different forms, different modes are the way to go here. Uh, multiple representations and expressions. Um, so before I give my thank yous at the end, I'd like to pass over to Genevieve Greaves, who's um, been working with Amy around the planning and delivery of this event. Um, it's an incredible project, Amy and Jen. Um, we really wanna thank you for holding this space for all of us. Mm -hmm. And to, of course, your incredible curation of um, speakers this week. Um, I haven't you know, been able to participate in a symposium that's been so kind and generous um, in terms of you know, passing the mic and creating space and uh, really open for you know generosity and learning so you know you, you the two of you have done such an incredible job with this so over to you Jen for some final uh, closing reflection. Um, thank you Mani and thank you for holding space for us so beautifully today. Um, it's just like such an honour to be a part of this I've just heard people speak all week who I um, respect so deeply and I've learned from and continue to learn from in so many ways and I've got pages and pages of notes but um, of course we don't have enough time and that's the only thing I would change about this experience is to give us a little bit more time to connect. Um, yeah, thank you so much, John, for today. You know, you're such a foundational person in this space and you've achieved so much and you've led the way and you're just such a strong, important theorist um, for our understanding. You showed that again today with that beautiful statement of memorials for now and for the future. It's just such a beautiful way to leave it. And you gave me shivers um, thinking about what we need right now to, to actually remember what's happening in our world this week and in the future and the unbound collective i could listen to you all day um you just bring so much strength and wisdom um you know i love the image of slapping the building you know <laughs> and the talking back that you do and the, in, the imprint that you make you know of resistance and critical love on these colonial spaces it's really um you're so inspiring in all that you do thank you but we started the week with um julie saying am i a memorial you know it was which was just such a profound statement for me to hear and of course julie's also such a foundational person in the space as is you know everyone who was speaking um 
I learned so much this week. I have so much to go away and and ponder and um, just hearing all the authors talk to their work has given us such richness. Um, we've got so much to, to carry on into this incredible book, which is um, so exciting. And, and being with you all this week has just given um, that book, you know, a new life. And it was just so interesting to hear Julie say that a book itself is a monument, you know, and, and write the book, but then pull it apart, you know, and scatter it everywhere and make your own mark. And that was, um, you know, another incredible moment from such a beautiful week. So thank you. I'm inspired and I'm full and um, I walk away with so much. Thank you all. Thanks, Jen, Amy, John, and Unbound. What an incredible day. Thank you to all the speakers, contributors, and everyone for joining us. We'd also like to thank our interpreters today, Tyson and Kat. A quick note of care. Uh, I think we've all been filled up this week, but we've also been, you know, hearing some very bold, brave, and important stories. So I think, you know, it's important um, to give gratitude for what we've heard, but also to make some space around what we've heard and what we're thinking. Share it with our family, colleagues, um, as we start to try to make sense of, you know, Australia's violent and amnesic histories. In fact, um, not histories, current day, as John reminded us. So we'd like to thank Jen Greaves and Amy Spears for organizing the symposium, the presenting partners, the Indigenous Settler Relations Collaboration at the University of Melbourne, the Contemporary Art and Social Transformation Research Group, CAST at RMIT University, and of course, Bianca behind the scenes, she's up in the corner named Aka. <laughs> who uh, and the team at ACA um, who have made it all happen in Melbourne, in Narm. So the program was uh, delivered with the assistance from the Australian government through the Australia Council for the Arts. And last but not least, we want to thank all of the speakers across all three sessions for contributing to the program. Julie Goff, Claire Land, Paola Bala, Kate Golding, Fiona Foley, Carol Q, Joel Sherwood Spring, Diane Jones, Odette Calada, Louis Brown, Unbound Collective, and John Mundine. So thanks again, everyone, and um, please take good care.